The world we inhabit is not as free, or certain, or safe as you might think. The things that you believe to be unassailably evident are little more than shadows dancing behind a curtain, a masquerade crafted and dutifully upheld by an organization known as the Foundation. The file you are about to hear contains containment procedures, descriptions, testing logs, historical and in some cases first-hand accounts of the anomalous objects the Foundation serves to secure, contain, and protect. Its contents have been thoroughly scrutinized by the Ethics Committee and approved by the O5 Council for release to trusted associates of the Foundation. This is SCP Unredacted. Unlike some of the other beasts I've encountered, almost everyone has heard about dragons. However, their rarity and eccentricities have left dragons horribly mischaracterized. The most egregious of these, in my mind, is the idea that dragons want to hoard gold. This is ridiculous. While dragons have been seen sleeping on piles of wealth, this is merely a consequence of their true pursuit. Followers. Where there is sentience, there is a dragon trying to amass followers. With followers comes food, water, and any other amenities a highly intelligent reptile may desire. In return, dragons are often more than capable of offering protection or assistance when hunting. To this end, dragons develop advanced telepathic abilities as they age, allowing them to easily communicate with all forms of life. Another misconception is that dragons refers to a single species. Dragons are, in fact, a small and elusive family of animals. As such, one should learn to recognize what a dragon is before the dragon recognizes them as food. Anatomy Dragons are large, scaled, usually quadrupedal reptiles. The aforementioned scales of adult dragons are incredibly tough, attempting to pierce them is a fool's errand. The scales on the underbelly are thinner, but be sure to avoid using knives and short bows regardless. Most men do not get a second chance to stab a dragon. In rare cases, one may get a chance to attack a dragon in flight. While the skin of a dragon's wing is tough, it is significantly easier to puncture than the scales. Causing a dragon to crash to earth is by far the safest way to slay them. I would highly recommend utilizing this method whenever possible. Dragons are most vulnerable in their eyes and inside their mouths. An excellent bowman may be able to strike these from range, but dragons provide the less martially inclined of us an alternative. Become one of the dragon's followers. If one spends enough time serving a dragon, it will, inevitably, give them a chance to strike. Dragons are acutely aware of this, and may attempt to use a suspected traitor for a short time before eating them. This creates a social dance where the dragon attempts to exploit the traitor as long as it can while the traitor attempts to get close enough to slay the dragon. Each side bluffs their weaknesses and naivety, hiding daggers behind smiles and kind words. The dragon may try to appear less threatening by telepathically sounding like a young child or a soft-spoken woman. In rare cases, it'll try to confuse the traitor by mimicking the traitor's own voice. I have performed this dance once. Although I came out victorious, I would dissuade readers from attempting it. Dragons will suspect that any highly intelligent creature is a traitor, doubly so for humans. However, the human knack for treason also makes human followers somewhat of a trophy to dragons. After all, what better testament to one's ability to rule than to have a human as a loyal servant? Regardless of whether you are human or not, subtly leveraging a dragon's pride is the easiest way to join its core. Unlike other reptiles, their ability to produce fire has made them warm-blooded. While cold-blooded reptiles are weak and sluggish in the cold, dragons remain as dangerous as ever. Do not let this catch you by surprise. Genera of Note While the information provided above is applicable to just about all dragons, the specific qualities of most genera of dragon will also shape how you interact with them. Examples follow. Drake Ask a person to picture a dragon and they will likely think of a drake. Growing over 20 feet long, drakes are one of the largest species of dragon. 
Their fire-spewing abilities are the muse of legends, and likely the origin of the belief that all dragons are adept fire breathers. In reality, all other genera of dragons are only able to scorch creatures within biting distance and light bonfires for their followers. Brooding Dragon Growing up to around 18 feet, brooding dragons are the only genus of dragon known to raise their young. Legend says that the scent of a brood pup can make a man drop dead. The reality is that if you're close enough to smell a brood pup, then you're about to learn where the brood mother is. Brood mothers will often amass huge followings that are divided among their young once they come of age. Whelp At only six feet long, whelps have resorted to scavenging and omnivorous foraging instead of going after big kills. As a defense mechanism, juvenile and adult whelps take on the appearance of brood pups. Their only consistent distinguisher from the aforementioned pups is their omnivorous diet and superior telepathic abilities. Whelps often have scavenging birds as followers. The bird finds the carcass and the whelp protects it as they eat. Whelp pups hide in burrows and often prey on insects. River Dragon A distant cousin of whelps, river dragons have adapted their wings and feet to be used as fins and flippers, respectively. At only five feet long and with no ability to spit fire, river dragons often kill their prey by drowning them. To this end, they're known to make followers out of any scavenger that will chase prey into the water. Flies, gnats, and ant colonies are common allies. Noble Dragon More commonly found in areas where the gravity or atmosphere does not allow creatures to grow to large sizes, noble dragons, sometimes called swarm whelps or parliament dragons, often do not exceed two feet. To make up for their small size, multiple dragons will collaboratively rule over a group of followers. Their name originates from this tendency to create a dragon aristocracy. Wyvern Only spotted on windy mountainsides, not much is known about wyvern. Best estimates say they grow to something between 9 and 15 feet. They're known to kill prey by lifting them off the ground and dropping them down the mountain slopes. Wetted Amphiptyr At around 10 feet long, wetted amphiptyrs are notable for never having more than a single follower. In rare cases, this has led to people acquiring wetted amphiptyrs as a strange sort of pet. A wetted amphiptyr with no followers is often referred to as a widowed amphiptyr, regardless of whether their follower has died or not. Cape Dragon Found in the most frigid climates, cape dragons grow to around 8 feet long and almost exclusively hunt larger animals. They have a single knife-like claw on each foot that they use to skin their kills. Their name comes from their tendency to wear the pelts of their kills for warmth. While some of these dragons are more formidable than others, it should be clear that the best course of action when encountering a dragon is to avoid it instead of confronting it. Doing so is not cowardly, it's just sensible. That being said, there is one dragon that should be slain if possible. Perhaps against my better judgment, I've included it below. Bookworm, the most elusive kind of dragon. I'm the only person to have ever seen a bookworm. Long and serpent-like, it's unknown how the bookworm manages to fly. Its scales shimmer and shift the light, making the bookworm nearly invisible and its true length indeterminable. I alone have seen it stealing books off the shelves of the library and never returning them. Many would say that this is impossible, that the nature of the library means that the books can never be truly removed from it, but I've seen it. I've been ridiculed, my name sullied and my title stripped as I searched for the creature that is sapping the library's knowledge. They say you do not exist, bookworm. One day, I will show them your severed head. Rumor says that long ago, a party of wise and fearful humans discovered a way to hold power over the jinn. They scattered themselves across the land, traveling to every corner of man's domain. One day, something changed. Some say a member had minced their words. Others claim that they believed their work to be over and retired, eventually forgetting their wish. Regardless, the group and their methods were lost to time and the jinn have made a slow return in their absence. 
I found myself on a well-trodden road, searching for a manor and following a rumor about a nearby vampire dwelling. Laying at the road's edge was an adorned canteen, the silver image of a tree embedded in the leather. I had never seen anything like it, at least not in Europe or in any other area where the civilization of man reigns supreme. There are multiple theories floating around as to the origin of Jinn. Some believe that Jinn are the souls of the power hungry who have been given unlimited power, but only to serve other people as divine punishment. Their malice, in turn, is petty revenge, scorn at the world for punishing their misdeeds. Others believe that the Jinn themselves are the punishment for the power hungry, who are destined to make a wish in pursuit of more power. A growing minority of people observe the Jinn's seemingly innate set of rules and their ability to twist words like a knife and assume that the jinn are some form of fae. In all cases, the evidence is inconclusive. Finding a jinn and wishing for more information is obviously ill-advised. As I removed the cap, dark green smoke fled out of the opening into the air above. By the time I dropped the canteen, the smoke had taken the shape of a legless, four-armed man. Although his biology shouldn't have allowed him to speak, for he didn't seem to have a biological spat in his being, words flowed effortlessly from him to me. Hardly anything is known about the jinn. What's immediately observable is that they are creatures of immense power, bound to both their word and their container by some unknown contract. What's noticed by the more experienced of us is that no two jinn are the same, varying so widely in size, shape, and color that their existence is an almost direct affront to taxonomy itself. Jinn take the appearance of thick plumes of smoke or translucent sources of light, while objects can be passed through a smoke or fire jinn's bodies, doing so as a bit of a faux pas. Jinn bear the silhouette of creatures both known and unknown and possess limited shape-shifting abilities. While not nearly as auto-malleable as the changeling, the Jinn can exaggerate and minimize its features, consequentially resulting in minor changes in size. A common way to distinguish a Jinn from an illusion or some other magical trickery is to look for their container. Jinn are bound to their containers, always keeping them nearby and retreating to them for rest. While Moroccan oil lamps are the most well-known container, they are by no means the only kind of container. I've seen Jinn find refuge in conch shells barrels, and even human garbage. It's unknown whether jinn choose a home or if they're bound to the one at birth or creation. Again, wishing for more information is ill-advised. Greetings, traveler. The smoke rippled and shifted as the being's arms gestured. I see that your keen eyes have found my hiding place. So clever, so perceptive. As much as I hate to say it, it seems you've beat me at my game. Game. I took a half step closer, mentally noting which weapons I'd recently sharpened. Yes, my hiding game. Since you've defeated me, I must give you your reward. If the creature had eyes, they would afflict with an inner fire. Ask for something, anything. Wish it, and I will make it real. Jin are not your friends. I pursed my lips. This is so critical that I am going to say it again. Jin are not your friends. I knew that there was no hiding game, only a plot to make me bring upon my own misery. They don't offer to grant wishes out of charity. They aren't polite or sycophantic because they like you. They only want you to make a wish so they can turn it against you. They are malice-filled creatures through and through. If you find one of the few well-intentioned genies out there, you will realize too late that there is no such thing. Once again, jinn are not your friends. And yet, the desire to summon my final target, to wish that the bookworm were with me so I could finally kill it, had sunk its fangs deep into my mind. I silently argued with myself about whether my wish could be turned against me, such is the nature of delusion. 
If you yourself want to get rid of a jinn, do not wish for their freedom. A soul must always fill the container and uphold the contract. You cannot remove the jinn's shackles without placing them upon yourself. I abandoned that canteen on the well-trodden road and did not speak a word to anyone until I reached a nearby town. In preparation for writing this entry, I met with an old friend by the name of Marcio Silva. While he primarily studies the Sphinx, his expertise on quick-witted beasts extends to the djinn. As I stepped into the town, I was greeted by a young woman dressed in fine silks. Her clothes flowed around her like a leaf in a stream, the majority of her face obscured in reds and oranges. Huntsman, I've been waiting for you. Marcio greeted me with open arms and a hot cup of tea. We chatted for a bit about life and the surprising paths it can take. It turns out that Marcio recently quit sphinx hunting. Eventually, we decided to take a walk through a nearby forest. I asked him about the ones who dominated the djinn. Their power was murder. Marcio finished his tea, quietly slipping the cup into his coat. They called themselves the djinn killers. And how did they do it? The same way you get a djinn to do anything. A wish. I turned to him. What kind of wish could kill a djinn? A terrible one. That word struck me as it came out of Marcio's mouth. Terrible. So airtight that it left no room for interpretation. I spoke to her about the mansion of vampires as we walked down the town's dirt paths. She told me the eldest of the vampires, who also owned the mansion, was Count Alphonse. As the day wore on, she offered to show me the town's pub. I had no desire to drink, but I was her guest, and so I accepted. And I assumed the wish wasn't written down anywhere. If any of it was, then it's since been erased. There's hardly a human soul that knows the gin killers by name. And how did you learn their true nature? I asked the gin. I stopped walking. You made a wish. As we worked our way through the night, our bodies coming closer and closer with every drink she bought on my behalf, she gave more snippets of information. There were either two or three vampires in the house. The youngest, little James, was around 35, and yet he had the appearance of a human but 16 years of age. Every time I made a motion to leave or an expression of disinterest, another morsel of information was dangled in front of my face. I didn't wish alone. Marcio seemed ready to throw his hands up in the air. He kept his composure. I workshopped it with people. I don't mean to wave the expert card around, but understanding this sort of thing is my field. I know what I'm doing. Then what did you wish for? The same thing I wanted when I began studying the Sphinx. I wished for the knowledge to save people. All things considered, it was a very safe wish. I couldn't think of any way it could be turned against him, but that's how wishes always are. What did you learn? I learned about the gin killers and what they did. I learned more about your journals and how you'd be coming here today. I learned about what will happen if you finish them. So my journals save people from the universe's monsters, or they will with your assistance. Huntsman, these journals are venomous. Even with his coat, I sensed the tightness in his shoulders, the way he gripped himself so that his limbs didn't flail in wild gesture. If they're going to save people, then what are the dragons? What are the fae? What are the selkies? Another verbal blow. They're creatures that kill when they can and maim when they can't. They're monsters, Marcio. And as we walked beneath the pale half moon, I thought more about the way she dangled information like a worm on a hook. I thought about how the drinks blunted my reason when I suddenly found my lips pressed against hers. Monsters with societies and cultures and traditions. Your elvish friend, Jikra. They aren't human, but you don't see them as a monster. Jikra isn't a monster. They have all the things you claim the monsters have. But the monsters do have them, because monster is an arbitrary term. I took a step towards him. 
Listen, Marcio. I don't know what that thing told you. I've seen monsters with my own eyes. I call them monsters because when I watch them, I can't find an ounce of morality in their lives. I can't find the flicker of a soul in their eyes. I thought about how we were kissing in a pitch black room, about how she'd kept the bottom half of her face covered until this moment. You don't see it because you aren't trying to understand a living being. Marcio's hand slipped into his coat pocket. You're trying to stalk prey. I'm studying them so that I can protect people. I realized that she wasn't a chance encounter. She didn't accompany me out of love or lust. Although Marcio lacked the presence of a large man, he was nearly as tall as me. His absent eyes met mine. You can't finish those journals, Huntsman. So, so much suffering is going to come out of it. People will die. His poise was unwavering, his voice passionate, yet composed. I don't want to see you get tricked like this. The ice in his blood brought mine down to a simmer as my hand slid into my jacket. There is no trick. I don't know how to make you see that. She was there to kill me. A flash of silver leapt from around Marcio's waist, severing locks of hair as it arced past my skull. In the next moment, my own knife shot from the folds of my jacket into his neck. We stood, frozen for a moment. His eyes met mine a second time before he fell to the ground. I drove a stake through her heart that night. I don't know if she had intended to kill me that night or if she was going to toy with me for longer before turning me into a pale carcass. Thankfully, the smoldering ashes of her corpse meant that I didn't need to find out. That evening, I buried him not ten feet away from where his blood had stained the soil. I buried him with our knives and a prayer. To the rest of the world, I relay this curse. If you wish with a djinn, it will be your demise. Long ago, I gave up my true name. Marcio gave up his life. Do not give them any more. In a majority of my travels, I dueled with beasts that have breath in their mouths and beating hearts in their breaths. There's a single way to defeat most of them cutting their life short through the specific means my contemporaries or I have devised. There are exceptions, such as the wooden stake for the vampire, silver bullets for the werewolf, and so on. The Nordic Draugr is a creature that has already had its knot tied and string cut, leading to some difficulty. It comes from a forgotten era, one with far more magic and great heroes than the present. The Nordic Draugr are reanimated corpses of former heroes and warriors. These bodies have been laid to rest in private burial chambers, many of which are still hidden to this day. The corpses returning to life occur due to accidents or curiosity, however. When one of these sites are disturbed, this body cannot be put back to rest. I've come to realize that the Draugr itself is actually not the body of the human, Instead, it's the soul. When disrupted, malice invades the once pure soul and re inhabits its body. I must reiterate that this is not a human. There is no humanity left, replaced instead hunger, torment, revenge, and restlessness. Do understand that they do not lack intelligence. Is it the intellect of a human? No. Draugrs are smart in their pursuit of flesh, utilizing tactics to ambush them and tire their opponent during battle. That stated, one human element does remain, their skilled combat experience. Due to the body's statuses as honored warriors, they're given a hero's burial. They're laid to rest while wearing their armor. Their signature weapons are often displayed nearby and they are left with several mementos from their fighting days. This makes them incredibly dangerous, as they can be immediately armed upon awakening. Appearances vary between Draugrs, but what is most common is their decomposing bodies. 
In my limited encounters, Nordic droggers have been nothing more than skeletons, covered in a thin and tattered layer of leathery green skin. The main danger posed by droggers is that they lack the feeling of pain. Overlooking their own injuries, they seek revenge with no regard for their safety. The single way to end an attack is the removal of the beast's head. My first encounter with this beast transpired in Iceland. This night, the 23rd of January, was a dark one. The midnight air would have frozen my canteen had I not kept it surrounded by blankets in my pack. I was traversing a summit in search of the mythic frost giant when I came across a village. It seemed to be recently abandoned as I saw no lights in their home or fires raging outside. There was barely a smolder in the communal fire pit which laid at the center of the village. I circled the area, calling out for people in my rudimentary Icelandic tongue. I got no response. In my sleuthing, I found that much of the meat storage in the town had been savagely ripped down and dragged through the snow. It appeared that much of it had been eaten as well, with now frozen chunks of beef and lamb penetrating the thick slush. My initial idea was a pack of ravenous wolves or a bear had smelt their foodstuffs and claimed it as their own. This has happened before, numerous times. However, it's mostly with campers deep in the woodlands. I began entering the vacant homes in hopes of a clue. Instead, I found corpses. One was of a little girl, no more than ten years old, and her father. Both had been mutilated, their limbs were torn off with great force, and much of their blood had been drained, leaving their bodies a sickly white and green. It was the fifth house I checked. It was a unique one. Part of it had been built into the mountain. I mention this because the back end of the house had been torn through. Behind this cavity was a tunnel about 150 paces in length, which led to an expansive cave. Icy stalactites protruded from the ceiling above me. I found the creature within the room, sleeping while standing up. A pile of meat laid opposite of where it stood. I tried my best not to awaken it as I approached. My previous assessment that this was just a cave was incorrect. This was a burial site for a warrior. An altar laid at the center of the room, one of white marble where the body should be laying. This was a soldier of moderate rank as displayed by their shield, which had been hung on the cave wall behind the altar. Its sword was removed by the draugr and placed into a scabbard around its waist. My weapon was unholstered, still equipped with the silver bullets from my previous werewolf encounter. I wasn't sure of its usage against the Nordic Draugr, however, it was too late for me to rummage through my supplies without disturbing it. I fired twice at its skull, piercing through both times. The creature remained standing and turned in my direction. It began its surprisingly swift approach and drew a sword from its belt. It swung at me with great strength. Its movements were extremely jerky, allowing me to easily dodge it. I discharged another round at the creature's chest. The bullet passed through the space where its heart should have been. The beast remained standing and fighting. I began to worry at this moment, thinking I had finally found an impregnable beast. I had been running low on ammunition and did not want to waste my reserves of silver bullets in case of another werewolf ambush. Northern Europe is notorious for this. I unsheathed my blade and began returning swings. Despite its sloppiness, the Draugr was an experienced opponent, blocking most of my strikes and giving swift retaliation. It sliced through my coat on my sword arm, drawing blood. I retaliated by moving its free arm with a prompt swing. The Draugr's attack did not slow. I felt myself grow exhausted and desperately searched for a method to end this battle. In my growing fatigue, the Draugr performed a move and collided my blade with its own, quickly twisted its hand and weapon clockwise, and pushed my sword from my grasp. I moved for defense and pulled the shield from its mounted display. I obstructed several would-be fatal strikes until the shield was cut asunder. Once again, left defenseless, I unholstered my pistol and made my way for the tunnel that led me here. 
I rolled under the draugr and gained my footing. It pursued my location, and once it barely reached the exit, I fired twice at the ceiling, ejecting the stalactites. They fell with great force onto the beast and pinned its lower half within the cave. Its free half continued to swing its blade and attempted to gain its freedom. I removed its sword arm with another bullet and kicked the weapon away. It continued to struggle against its trap. With its own blade, I removed the demon's head with a single strike. It ceased its fighting. In all of my travels, I've never encountered a beast as bloodthirsty and territorial as the late Captain Corrigan, whose mere name struck fear into the hearts of sailors along the European coast. He was built like two stallions and hairier than a Russian frost ogre. He smelled like a fugitive whaler, his skin stained by the brine of the abyss and the viscera of nautical monstrosities he'd killed. Some called Corgan the greatest living pirate. Some said he wasn't alive in the first place, although they would unfortunately be proven wrong decades later. He never bothered to learn the names of his crew. Shipmates came and went with every voyage. Whether they left by dock or by death was decided by the sea, and the sea alone. Corrigan and his men were pirates of a different sort, harvesters of the Great Blue itself. They were not poachers, nor were they whalers, though I'm sure some crewmates told themselves that so they could sleep through the frigid nights. No, Corrigan was a glory seeker, a hunter like myself, entranced by the titans found within the blue expanse. At one time, our relationship was that of a master and apprentice, though it slowly evolved to a bitter rivalry as we both realized our true capacities for hunting outweighed any possible chance of an amicable, working relationship. I've rarely broken my composure when dealing with another hunter, but I'm not ashamed to admit that many a night aboard Corrigan's ship ended with a cutlass pointed at his throat and a pistol pushed against my stomach. I miss him dearly. His ship would seldom make port, but when it did, even the rowdiest of sailor dives and roughneck pubs would bar their doors, lest Corrigan decide he was thirsty. No matter which iteration of the giant's halberd dropped its anchor, the droning shanties of the crew and bearded Jolly Roger made the captain's presence unmistakable. There was one day a year Corrigan made sure he was on land for, as I would forever hold my superiority over his head if he dared miss the trawler's game. The event went largely unchanged. In the dead of winter, the two of us would meet at the Hanging Cleavage Bar on the pirate port island of Paraiso Azul, a former Spanish outpost and newly christened hub for all variety of extraordinary, supernatural, and wholly unsavory folk. We would drink to our limits, if Corrigan had one I never did know, and share exaggerated stories of our most recent exploits. Both of beast and woman, Corrigan never had luck with the latter since we had last seen each other. Then after a night of companionship, drunken antics, and almost certainly a bar fight or three, we would take leave for our ships and prepare for the game. The rules were simple. In the morning, the two of us would set sail on individual ships. Each was outfitted with heavy artillery and the spoils of our previous hunts. Notably, we each lacked a crew. We would sail to the stormy, uncontrolled waters affectionately nicknamed Poseidon's Cradle where the maelstroms and typhoons set the backdrop of most encounters with the horrors that called that stretch of hell home. We would spend three days on the endless blue, practically inviting death as a shipmate. The winner of the game was the man who brought back the biggest catch, told the biggest tale, held the grandest proof. I never won the trawler's game. I did once come close. I will keep to the spirit of the game, though it's long since over, and tell you that story as I would in those days. There was a particular creature who troubled us each year. Troubled is an understatement. It was the only living thing that scared the captain. It did not have a name, and if it did, it had been lost to time. We called it the Leviathan, after the biblical creature, but also on the account that a name less grandiose would downplay its significance in the storied history of the trawler's game. It was the Leviathan that destroyed Corrigan's first ship. It was the Leviathan that took his leg and the lives of many men who served in his crew. Wherever the captain hunted, it was the Leviathan who hunted him. To say it had a vengeance would be inaccurate, as revenge implies a shred of human understanding, 
and the Leviathan should not be granted such luxuries. It was a force of nature, and it ruled the seas because nothing could challenge it. The Leviathan did not know danger. It was danger, and every other natural instinct that arises when we see something bigger, stronger, and deadlier than ourselves. I suppose I can describe it. The Leviathan was truly gigantic. The size of several ships combined could not compare to the creature's full length, that was not unlike an eel in form. A lengthy serpentine body and a gaping maw surrounded by hundreds upon hundreds of needle-thin teeth, a second jaw contained mast long bristle-like fangs that greeted its prey upon entry. It could breach the surface of the water with its body, bringing its funneled snout to the clouds as if it was puppeteered by a string from above. It caught sight of ships with its bulging bloodshot eyes, ramming them at full speed with the hardened plate on its forehead. Its bruised black skin was like junk steel, warped and scarred from long won confrontations. Sailors, hunters, and God knows whatever other creatures lurked on Poseidon's cradle all had their chance at the Leviathan. And yet, only the Leviathan stood. We had given the Leviathan some scars of our own over the years. First, there was the psychosis harpoon lodged into its right eye that undoubtedly did not do its temperament any favors. There was also the infectious parasitic artillery shell buried somewhere inside its stomach. For a lesser creature, the swarm of hob flies contained within would have torn their soul to bits in under 20 minutes. I would be lucky if the Leviathan succumbed to their onslaught in the next few millennia. Then you had the multiple tears in the decorative frilled orange membrane that lined its back, raised across the creature like an unending sail. While not all of those holes were pierced by Corrigan or myself, I'd like to believe we accounted for the majority of them. Finally, there was our crowning achievement, and the one that gave the Leviathan a most frightening, unearthly appearance. The creature's neck had been almost entirely separated from its body. Yes, the head of the Leviathan hung limp from the rest of it, exposing a mass of tissue and bone that had grown over the wound in its body's attempt to heal an injury it should have never recovered from. When it growled, it gurgled, screaming in pain and attempting to swing its pendulous hanging head towards the sky. This was the result of a combined effort from Corrigan and myself. When the beast had attacked decades ago, while our ships were still within close vicinity of one another. It was a crossbow, powered by what may well have been manifested vengeance, fired with enough force to nearly sever the monster's head from its body. Within seconds, the sea was a deep scarlet. Somehow, be it by sheer strength or through forces beyond my understanding, the Leviathan persisted. The Hunt A hint of the sun peeked over the horizon when Corrigan and I set out that morning. Our galleons were large enough to carry even the thickest hides we could encounter, with enough artillery to blow them clean away. The first day was uneventful. Upon reaching the cradle, we went our separate ways. I cannot remember the exact order of events, as my attention was focused on manning my ship through my own efforts. But I encountered no less than three living whirlpools, a spout serpent, and five mega squids. It was migration season. While each posed a challenge, none were great enough to even entertain the idea of winning the game. At the end of the day, a fine layer of sweat and sea salt covered my person, and I was ready to collapse and fall overboard. For all of my effort, I had nothing to show for it, but hope was yet to be lost, as I had a strategy. In my travels, I had corresponded with a Velthuvian monk who informed me of the ongoing food scarcity in her coffin commune. The monks were a prodigious, large people, each requiring the food of ten human men to sustain themselves for a day. To lure the beasts that plagued their crypt cities into traps, they used gemstones covered in carved runes that sung out when struck. They called it the Jewel of Amon, and I had acquired one specifically for this purpose. I slammed the signet towards the ship's floor, struggling to maintain my balance from the resultant shockwaves. Mustering all of my strength, I scooped the jewel into my hands and tossed it overboard. The silence was appreciated for the ten minutes it lingered and then the evening sun disappeared. Rising from the water was a hanging black square whose shadow engulfed the ship and every ray of light that shone upon it. A seemingly endless stream of water poured from the thing's jaws, my nose filled with the stench of brine, blood, and fear. The creature stared with giant cloudy red wheels, each damaged in line with its own injuries. A low rumbling noise quaked from the serpent's stomach that erupted into a thunderous bellow 
that nearly capsized my ship. The beast lunged forward, its neck snaking directly towards me. I heaved my electro-webbed Artica rifle over my shoulder and pointed forward. Then it stopped. As if an impenetrable barrier was in its way, the beast stopped. It hung in the sky, lifeless. Its eyes widened into an expression I could only construe as shock. And suddenly, the terrifying serpent was torn away, pulled into the sky with enough force to send a wave directly pointed at my ship. I clung to the mast. The salt of the water stung my eyes, and then my vision cleared. The beast that had emerged from the water minutes earlier hung lifeless in the jaws of another. It was even larger than the first and bore twice as many injuries. A glut of viscera and barnacles emerged from its neck, forming a mass of hardened tissue and bone. There was no mistaking its visage. The Leviathan had found me. It dropped the serpent into the water and curled its mouth into a demonic smile. The smell of rotting corpses filled the air, and if it weren't for the plugs in my nose, I would have succumbed to the odor. While it seemed larger than when we'd last met, I was also much better equipped. I welcomed the beast with outstretched arms, convinced that this encounter would be different. The Leviathan thrashed and then launched itself through the water with unbelievable agility. The sound of cracking wood stung my ears as my ship split down the middle, harpooning itself on the forehead bulge of the Leviathan. I clung to a piece of wood that had lodged itself atop another and jumped to my feet. The abomination shot into the air, causing pieces of my boat to fall into the sea below. I dug my hands into a barnacle and began climbing downward, moving toward the creature's maw. The edges of the growth grated skin from my hands like a sharpened knife, but I persisted. My plans were soon diverted by another dart into the water that blasted the air from my lungs, quickly replacing them with brine. I had lost my grip and was sinking rapidly. I gazed above the leviathan's massive body casting a great shadow. The creature darted below once again, swimming directly toward me. Its mouth slowly opened, swallowing the world around it. There was no escape, but I did not fear. Instead, I used my remaining strength to swim forward, guaranteeing that I would be caught within the leviathan's too large maw. When the creature had swallowed me completely, I knew I had won. Its mouth was a spacious realm of pink, red, and brown. Even my nasal suppressants could not fully block the stench. I laughed. After years of confrontation, I had finally gained the courage to test a long-standing theory of mine. While the outside of the Leviathan was as hard as any creature could be, its inside could be much, much more malleable. In the distance, I spotted the section between the neck and head, where scabbed excess had grown between the wounds. Reaching into my pocket, I wrapped my hands around a small metal sphere no bigger than a plum. It was a high-grade ammunition I had obtained from the Temple of the Godbreaker, ancient technology and forbidden for a reason. I chanted the opening seal and hurled the sphere as close to the wound as possible. If this is where I would die, then I would do so in peace, as the victor of the final trawler's game. Of course, the bomb would only activate if the being radiated a divine presence. I should consider it lucky that a lavender explosion of theological proportions expanded around me. The sphere had triggered. The beast was not mortal, though I'm not sure which potential revelation this experiment would result in could have carried worse implications. I would describe the great flaying of skin, the bubbling of blood and burning of waters around me, but I remember none of it. The world around me collapsed. Something large and wet slapped the side of my head. Everything was black. I awoke several days later aboard a merchant ship. Missing nearly all of my clothes in my left arm wasn't the first time, wouldn't be the last. Apparently, I'd been passed around from ship to ship for the past few days, and this one was the present recipient of my bruised body. The sailor's courtesy was no doubt due to the square insignia tattooed on my neck, which represented a kinship with Corrigan. Leaving a man with the mark of the halberd to die at sea was tantamount to suicide as the captain would pursue those who wronged his allies to the end of the map and beyond. I thanked the merchants graciously. After some convincing, we made port for Azul, where an impatient Corrigan punched me in the face for making him wait. He caught an unusually large mega squid, the benign capture of which had greatly disappointed him. I had caught nothing. Like that, another round of the trawler's game came to a close. Its unsurprising victor slapped me on the back and offered a drink as compensation. 
Corrigan never did believe my story. But again, why should he? The Leviathan found him the next week. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, join my Discord community, hire me on Fiverr, or help support me by becoming a patron for as little as $3 a month. Regardless of tier, all patrons get early access to every single episode. The links are in the description. I don't have the talent it takes to write a skip. All I do is read. Original authors make this podcast possible, so credit to the original author. Their link's in the description. Show them some love as well. Consider becoming a member of the SCP Wiki. Upvote their work and maybe write a skip of your own. Maybe I'll read it here someday. You never know if you never try. The content of this podcast and content relating to the SCP Foundation, including the SCP Foundation logo, is licensed under Creative Commons ShareLite 3.0, and all concepts originate from scpwiki.com and its authors. This recording, being derived from this content, is hereby also released under Creative Commons ShareLite 3.0.